All right. Welcome to the Growing with Fishes podcast, episode 189, um, with uh, Angela Ten, Ten, uh, Tenbrock. Sorry, I should have asked you how to pronounce your name proper before it's we started. <laughs> Ten men along the brook who couldn't spell brook, you know? So. <laughs> uh, all righty. Um, uh, thanks a lot for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. This is going to be an, I think this is going to be a fun and lively show for all of us. Uh, yeah, I've, I've watched your work from afar and uh, from close up, and I think this is going to be some fun. <laughs> we also have Marty is with us as well this week. Hello, how's it going? Yeah, nice. It's nice been an exciting day, and I'm I'm Steve from Potent Ponics. If you haven't heard seen the show before, we had an exciting day today. We had the first uh, black mamba spotted on the farm, so that was that was fun. So <laughs> get your well, blood pumping early. Yeah, make, make sure you're ready to go. Make sure that heart works, that's for sure. <laughs> um, so thanks a lot for joining us, Angela. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do and uh, how you got started with aquaponics? Yeah, so um, as I was telling you before the call, before the, we started was, you know, our family for as many generations as we can see uh, have someone in every line has been a farmer. And, um, you know, in the 1970s, my great-grandfather started doing uh, hydroponics we, we adopted the Dutch method and it was kind of innovative and different back then. You know, he was doing some interesting stuff with how he held his water and, and how he spun the water and so forth. We have this belief about spinning our waters and some science over there and that side. But, um, and that comes from my great grandfather's, he started this science and technology of it. And um, so even as a little girl, I was uh, in the greenhouse and I had what we called low chores and the low chores uh, kept us from, um, kind of kept me at a certain area is what I was able to reach and what I was able to do. And um, at the end of my work time each day, I would uh, go to the creek. There was a little creek around it and I would actually pick the fish. Like I, I was just an impish kind of kid and I would get fish and um, I would bring them back into the greenhouse and drop them in the water and uh, they would dissolve. And the little kid in me always thought that was fascinating. Well, one day my grandmother was in there and I thought I was doing something really special. And I'm like, they're magic, Granny, they're magic, look. And she like tore my butt up. And I was like, but when we fish, you make me put the scales in the green, you know, in our row plants and so forth. And she's like, that's totally different. You're gonna mess up our system. We were hydroponic beefsteak. Local uh, grocery, you know, grocery store chain um, known as Winn-Dixie. And so um, that was kind of my intro to, you know, the greenhouse at five years old. And um, fast forward, you know, I was my family's uh, great uh, hope to go to college. I have almost a PhD and my education's in women's sexual health. Here I am in aquaponics. So um, a few years ago, I had an, I was tinkering. Uh, I'm a kind of a tinker engineering kind of person. And I was tinkering while I was uh, working in the school system on a project that was very uh, special and had not been done in our area. And uh, we were doing uh, fish um, and we were doing marine and fresh uh, fish and every time I would throw my water out I would notice that my plants would grow and so I started tinkering with it and uh, this is like 2011 you know um, and I'm like you know I was thinking back to my childhood you know my, we did do this and I, you know I was remembering kind of my life and uh, so I was talking to a, a gentleman that was there and he said to me he's like uh, you know, my dad has this farm. Maybe you should come out and try to your experiment on our, on our farm. And I was like, oh, okay. And so I would go out there and I was going back to medical school as just so happened. And I was rehashing all of my credits. Anyway, long story short, I go out there. The guy offers me a job. I end up taking it. I'm only going to be there one year. And uh, in 2012, like December of 2012, we began Trader Hill. And um, from there, we went, we started in a chicken barn where we had no light, no, nothing like chicken crap inside of a barn. And uh, we started with 5,000 holes and he called it my experiment. And so uh, from, from my experiment of 5,000 holes, uh, we hired in some experts um, and they are experts we all know. Um, and uh, it seemed as though the science that I was aiming for and what they were aiming, what they were doing was kind of discongruent. It wasn't, it was kind of uh, not very, I'll call it professional. It was great for a hobby system, 
but it wasn't professional. I mean, we had had 5,000 holes. To me, that's a hobby system. Uh, a bigger system to me is when you start talking about, you know, you're trying to take away or, uh, impl you know, kind of impact, um, you know, land to uh, land use and what we're doing with our land and so forth. So I was building my footprint around if I was growing 25, one acre of, of romaine lettuce, how many holes would I need and what size would I need? So I, start, I went about that in that direction because you know everybody grows lettuce, it's so easy, right? And so um, that's where I started. And um, we went from 5,000 holes where it went, I worked, I tried out lights. Uh, we were doing lights in, in 13, early 13, uh, LED uh, lights at, for a Canadian company. Um, and we had a cone of span of 11 feet um, and, you know, we were having rock star awesome growth with Salanovas and a whole bunch of other stuff. And um, one night um, in this chicken barn, they cut the hay fields around me. And the next day I came in and my whole crop was gone. And I was like, you know, we need some more controls. So I went about putting the chicken house into kind of controls. So I put up thrip screen and I put up fans and I put up an isolation chamber um, before you walked in, whole variety of things. So from there, we went to um, 5,000 and then we hired the experts and went to 25,000. So we had a collective 30,000 in this chicken barn and I could convince no one that it was food safe, no one. And they were like, it's a chicken house. Chicken ran around in there, it's disgusting. And so uh, at that time, uh, Mr. Blotto said to me, he said, uh, Angela, you're the only expert I know, design it the way you think it should be done. And I was like, off to the races. So we designed it and um, I uh, had the uh, good fortune of working with engineers and architects who understood my vision and what I was trying to do with my biology and what I was trying to do with food safety. So what I felt like separated most aquaponics people, why they couldn't really see themselves as commercial was because they were unable to cut the mustard with the food safety regulations. As a whole, farmers are kind of rebels, but as a larger whole, aquaponic farmers are the real rebels. They're like, I'm gonna do it my way and there's nothing you could tell me about it, I'm gonna do it my way. So uh, what I found was is that, you know, I needed to kind of take a step back and join the crowd of hydroponic growers and see what they were doing to be able to sell to the masses. So I endeavored on that and so, we built our next facility. So we had 5,000, 25,000, then another 25,000. So a collective 55,000. And then uh, when I built that facility in eight weeks, we had this rock star awesome uh, building crew with us who works with us still today, who understood what I was trying to do because they had worked with me on a few other projects. And they built for me, you know, I built my facility with food safety. So I went into the ground a certain depth. I ran my water in a certain depth. I had a maintenance plan. I, you know, I had to cut the mustard because I wanted to sell my products to the masses. So in October of 2015, uh, I set, we set for the first time to have SQF certification. And that's actually a different certification than Primus or GAP. It's like you use science to tell about what you do. And I felt like that was the most important thing was that we had science drive what we were doing. So I could explain why I had my maintenance program, why I was collecting data for my water and my nutrition of my plants and my plants every week or monthly for that test. I had a baseline data of 24 months of water samples, 24 months of uh, product samples. That means that I took my products and my water and sent them to a third party lab for 24 months to get a baseline. That is science. I had science backing me up, someone outside of me saying, yes, in fact, what you're doing and what you're saying is correct and here's why. So my belief back then and my belief today is, is if we use science to guide our decisions, we will be better off. We built, uh, we were the first aquaponics facility in the world to get SQF level three certification. Level three is means that you not only have the food safety parameters, but you also have the food quality. So we could show sh shelf, life, shelf life testing of 
you know, uh, three weeks on our shelves before we had 50% shrink. We could show uh, shelf life testing of Swiss, Swiss shard for 30 days inside of a clamshell, which, you know, people are like, what? That can't be. We had documented proof of our shelf life. So all of these things took us to the fact that we had to have someone validate what we were doing. So SQF allowed us to be able to do that. So we chose to do SQF. Global Gap, it, uh, Gap is a great entry level if you just want to sell to your community. Global Gap to me is your next level. Primus and those kinds of certifications have traditionally not been in favor of our types of growing. But SQF was an international standard. So people, I felt like I was doing something for our community as aquaponics you know, practitioners. I was saying, hey, if you can get SQF certification, you know, you should, you then can cut the mustard. And um, so every year Traders Hill has sat through SQF certification. Uh, I sold Traders Hill in 17. When I sold Traders Hill, we were at 155,000 plant holes, 70,000 square feet. Uh, we were the largest continuous operation in the United States at that time. And we started making money. I wanted to grow multiple crops. And so I said, I felt like I needed to bring food to the masses. And so I set out on this idea of a hub and spoke approach. Um, whereas we grow in the urban environment and in the rural environment, our suburban environment, and all work together to be able to sell our products because they're the highest quality things you can grow to the masses. And that's my story. <laughs> that's really, really one of the reasons why I wanted to get you on the show is you're one of the few people in aquaponics that actually looks at data the same way that the cannabis guys do that really pours through the nutrient data and the tissue and in the water and, and, you know, there aren't too many, I mean, we, we were talking about this when we were, when, before we did the show. And, you know, there's really a, only a tiny handful of people that are really focused in on this level of detail with their data collection and aquaponics. And um, it's one of the biggest reasons why we wanted to have you on because there, there aren't really that many people you can have a, a conversation with on these kinds of levels. Uh, what was some of the challenges that you found trying to get your testing data stuff done or um, some of the other stuff uh, and data collection that maybe you came across that, uh, you know, uh, maybe you could pass some advice on to other people trying to, to do similar projects? Yeah, so an interesting, there was a couple of interesting things that I found along the way. First thing is, um, you know, for you to be able to sit for these, someone has to take the initiative to be, get all the certifications. So if I was to write my name and I had to put my certifications for aquaponics behind that, I would have HACCP, PCQI, SQF, okay? And to get those, those designations, you have to go to school and you have to, it's a little bit of an investment. But when you go to those classes, you're in classes with people who are the largest growers in the world I was. I mean, I was in classes with people who were growing like stuff you see in the grocery store and all over, no matter where I'm at in the world, I see their stuff in the store. Um, even in the markets and like developing nations, I see their stuff. And so I knew there was something to what I was doing that they were doing too, which I felt like was responsible for me. Um, some of the challenges that I encountered were uh, the fact of explaining to people when they're HACCP plan. So when you have a HACCP plan, you have a, a physical, chemical, and biological situation that you have to deal with. And writing a plan for each of the things that say, yeah, we know that that's in our facility and here's how we control for it. Most people know that they have issues, but they're unwilling to say, hey, this is my problem. Here's how I can solve it. They're like, oh, we don't want to talk about that. Shh, no, no, no. What you need to do if you want to be a commercial grower, you need to be okay with the fact that your system or your facility may have a flaw and here's how you're going to overcome it. So see, one of the things that I do is, is I actually work with people to help them go commercial. So if you're going to go commercial, there's some lessons that, you know, it cost me ten, twelve thousand dollars to learn that with a consultant, you wouldn't have to necessarily. For instance, when you send your water to the um, to your lab, you need to explain. They're going to call you and they're going to say, you have fecal coliform. Yes, in fact, I do. 
I know I do. Um, and so how are you going to manage that? What are you going to do? So you say to them, my normal conversation at, for the first few months of the baseline data was, yes, I, I do know this. Can you tell me that what the number is? Okay, that's within my parameters of what's acceptable for our grow operation. Okay. And then you say to them, can you take it through and see if their A is E. coli and B, is it E. coli that, you know, O15, you know, those things that we are we are most concerned with that make people sick. And every month they would, you know, I would have Uh, the person who tested my stuff would go, just take it on through. And it didn't cost any more. It was a piece, you know, a DNA test. Um, it didn't cost any more. So you have to educate the people that are working with you in your labs to understand what your data needs to be. You need to understand what your appropriate numbers need to be. What, your, what are your TDSs? What are your, you know, uh, the uh, uh, maximum levels and, and minimum levels? You need to understand that. The other thing that I don't think people pay attention to is the fact that our systems naturally have uh, sometimes more nitrogen. And we can actually give, grow plants that actually um, are, have too much nitrogen in them. They can make animals sick if they eat them. And so people think that, oh, you know, it's no big deal, it's nitrogen. Um, I don't, I, I, that's a, probably a conversation on the biology, which I think we should probably cover because I think the science in aquaponics now isn't the system. The system's figured out. The science now is in the biology. So we go out um, in, in public and say that we have soil water. That is our proprietary blend of water that we have. So uh, you'll hear me talk about when you see uh, on the blog pages, post and people are asking questions about, you know, uh, can I add this chemical to lower my pH, change my pH, this or that? Okay, I can tell you that from my own experience, my pH never had a major dip. Excuse me. My pH never had that main swing. Uh, it never, uh, I generally have my pH in levels that they say you can't grow plants, okay? Uh, I use nano bubbles from the time I began. I knew it was something important because it was what we did. When my great grandfather, we always aerated our systems. I knew that in the root zone, if I kept my plants with aeration, that they osmotically, uh, the membrane cross of the, would allow that plant's mouth to always stay in open. Um, and so we had faster growth because of this. Um, you know, there's all these things. I think the science going forward is in food safety, the place that we're gonna spend a lot of time in aquaponics going forward is in the system design. It's in food safety, so we can take our products to the masses, and in biology. Absolutely, and one of the things I want to touch on too is we've had some luck with, in, in cannabis, we have a lot of issues with um, pathogens, and if we have E. coli or something like that, they'll, they'll fail us from selling it all to the public, but we've had a lot of good luck with treating a lot of those things that like you said, that aren't actually pathogenic, but maybe test and, and flag the test using lactobacillus uh, labs actually from Korean Natural Farming and having that part of our food safety program uh, on a regular dosage just to eliminate those. And, and, you know, again, turning to biological, like you're saying, turning to biological solutions and kind of pushing the science ahead on, on some of these things that, hey, maybe you don't need to go out and spend a whole bunch of money on some random chemical or some some you know uh, proprietary microbial blend. Maybe you just need to grab some kefir and some milk in a five gallon bucket and just brew it yourself. And this this is kind of really is one of the things that I was excited to bring you on about is because you are really pushing the edge on a lot of this stuff and doing things that aren't um, you know traditionally being done the same way because there's so much like you're saying so much bad information in our our particular industry of aquaponics in particular um and, and it really holds everyone back especially when I mean, you see the case with um canada this year with um, them you know being all paranoid about food safety and how none of that's really founded on any kind of uh, disease oh. outbreak or anything like that it's just you have you have other uh, agriculture trying to push these 
uh, myths and, and things on the market in order to corner their own market. So that's the, the other end of it, uh, you know, as far as uh, uh, who, who's bringing these, these topics up is uh, sometimes it's actually other growers that want to move in on your market or protect their own market, it's particularly the organic guys get really, really upset about some of this stuff. So, yeah, actually, uh, I was at the NOSB uh, meeting and I was the last speaker of the day uh, when they were here in the Southeast. And okay. um, they agree that we are organic. Uh, they won't go on, on, on uh, you know, in public and say that. Um, they know that, you know, the interesting thing about what we do, Steve, is, is that not only do we, you know, we, we do coupled, decoupled and terminal in aquaponics. So um, what we found was, is that um, when we were growing our products, we would be actually able to, um, if a product, so we grow, first of all, I probably should tell you that I don't just grow lettuce. I grow 31 different products. So I grow like, I mean, if you, right now I'm studying potatoes and ginger to see if we can do them in aquaponics um, because I've had luck with carrots. I've had luck with um, uh, celery. I've had luck with beets. Um, so I do believe that I'll be able to uh, figure out the potato. Um, and um, so right now I'm working on that, but that's a story for another day, I guess. Um, but the interesting thing is, is that so often people want a quick, fast remedy and aquaponics, as I would say to people, aquaponics isn't hydroponics where you dial in your chemicals and you know that these chemicals are going to this thing and this is what your output's going to look like. If you over push calcium or magnesium, you're going to get, you know, blossom and rot. If you do this or that. Um, aquaponics isn't that, that's the beauty of it and the challenge of it. The beauty of it is, is that I can actually build my facilities all over, which we've built 26 different facilities. Um, and we know that, that we can actually give what we call the red book, which is the operating manual, manual for each of your facilities. So if we build a facility for you, we go into the facility and we say, okay, at this position on Mondays, you need to do this at this position on Tuesday. And it all relates back to food safety and being able to sell your food to the masses. Because it is my belief that if we do not sell our food to the masses and tell our story, it is our fault. And so I believe as aquaponics practitioners, we have a far superior way of growing. We have a growing method that will, can grow anywhere in the world and we can grow pretty much anything. So what we do with our, um, with our, what we call, everybody has it black gold, that you have your bottom solids that uh, you should not be running through your system because they haven't quite um, you know, transferred as they needed to. Um, we actually take and put it what we call terminal in um, irrigation. And so what we do is, is we have a rainwater collection barrel that actually uh, gives us two PSI at 100 feet um, and we are able to, uh, when we have that rainwater collection each day, because we are in the rainy south, it runs in and it irrigates in a fan method to um, actually irrigate underneath the, the, the raised grow beds that we have out or either in our fields. And so we actually take and emit our, our black gold onto that. And what we have found is, is that the soil has become so enriched that we can only dose it with that once a month. So we have to come back to it once a month. We did that with uh, fruit trees. We do that with pineapples. We do it with strawberries, peppers, anything you can grow, cannabis, all of it, it all. And then you get this really robust plant that actually has um, some seemingly better qualities because of the microbes that have come off the system. So anyway, um, I feel like, you know, we should toot our own horns and we should be growing things um, that people traditionally haven't thought of being able to grow and we can do it commercially. Um, but the food safety thing is the biggest act, you know, situation. And, you know, when I work as a consultant, uh, like right now, um, I work um, like in the cannabis space, uh, the way I work is I come through and, um, you know, I help you with, I, I observe your facility and your protocols. And then what I do is to say, hey, have you thought of this? Um, or 
have you considered uh, this way? Um, and what we have been able to do is, is help people who are um, smaller growers or larger growers help um, their whole, everybody on the, in the facility is actually a member of the safety team. That's awesome. Uh, a lot of people really struggle with their food safety for cannabis in particular, and uh, it, it, especially if you're getting into aquaponic cannabis, uh, there aren't really too many people uh, out there doing the, this kind of stuff. And uh, it really is a, a huge sector, especially with how much more, uh, you know, you're seeing uh, testing and everything being done in different states now, especially the newer states. Um, it can be a, a, an area that really comes back to bite you. Um, do you want to tell us more about, you know, some of the different consulting stuff that you do and some of the, I know you do courses as well and, and webinars and all kinds of good stuff to get the information out there. Yeah. So, um, the paid things that I do uh, are around consulting. So um, what we would, what we do is, is we come in, um, we like to come in, if you're going to design a facility or we like to come in in your design phase. And so that you are actually, we're, we're working with you to say, hey, you know, you need to consider uh, pest intrusion. So how are you going to deal with pest intrusion in your facility? Um, and, you know, have you considered this? And some of these things are so inexpensive or no brainers that people are like, what? I never would have considered that. For instance, one of the things I always talk about are walk paths. People never consider how their employees walk through their place. If you don't consider it, it's going to bite you real quick. And so, you know, I always say to them, hey, look, I know, you know, my favorite thing to say is, is she Okay. And so many times people are, you know, uh, they, they shudder at what things cost. Um, and that's not because, um, you know, people are out there trying to build. I think we lost her for a second. I'm not sure what uh, what happened to the audio there. Yeah, I don't know if it's been just me or not, but her audio has cut out a couple of times. <clears throat> She's having a couple of issues, but no, no worries. We'll, we'll get it straightened out here. Yeah, I just wasn't sure if it was just me or not. Yeah, I thought it was just my African internet. <laughs> I suspected. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, no, it seems fine. I'm also uh, in a, you're moved into your place, right? Uh, we're about halfway moved in. Um, we're, well, you're, you're located there right now, right? Or are you in that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm on a gas generator and working now. We're getting trying to get the solar up and running. Nice. So I'm working on getting that together. Let me message her real quick. But yeah, and we had the first Mamba sighting at the farm today, so that, that was that was fun. Uh, well, I, you know, hopefully she comes back because, you know, really liked what she had to say. I think that it's, you know, we've talked about this on the podcast lots of times in terms of, you know, people that track actual data versus measure their own progress in their head. <laughs> um, it, you know, it's always a, it's always a welcome thing. I feel like that's the only thing that's ever really going to take anything farther. You know, like you can always have home growers, even like myself that are just growing for yourself that can you know, provide anecdotal things, but you're always going to need people that document data uh, to be able to, you know, really move things forward and change people's minds about the way that they grow. So um, other than that, I would just say that uh, you, you got to put product in front of them. It seems like that's about the, the only other way, because even data, sometimes they'll be like, oh, well, you, you must not have tested it right or tracked it right or whatever. So, you know, it's always, it's always difficult to, uh, to deal with any type of naysayer, but the, to me, those are the two different things that you can really do is, is track data that you can make them prove it wrong or <clears throat> deliver them results that taste better or smoke better or whatever, have better nutrient density, whatever it is that you're you know, looking to measure. Um, measure it 
So there's so many people that, like we talked about, that just say, oh, I, I watched all the videos on the internet and I decided this was the best way before I even started. And just because I finish a grow and I got some type of yield and it, and it smoked decent, it means that it's the best way to grow on the planet. And I know it for sure because I've done this three times now, so I'm an expert. And you've only done it one way, you know, like it's always frustrating for me, you know, like, so I, I admire the data collection because I can't even, I don't even have the, uh, well, I probably do now that I'm in a much more stable place um, growing wise and not changing all the time. So, you know, I'll probably be able to do, do more experimenting. I've got a couple actual pheno hunts going, seeds that are dropped, so. For hey guys, I'm back. I'm so sorry. My phone, uh, I'm on my phone now. So for some reason, my computer's like screwed up. Oh no. That's all right. We were just chit chatting while we were ready to get back. All right. So uh, what did we hear last? What do we want to rock on with? We, we do have few pro fewer problems with Zoom than we did with Google Hangouts. Google Hangouts, we've had some the old stuff, we had some pretty epic failures with, <laughs> with issues, but thankfully Zoom- There's some really, really rough audio <laughs> on some of the old ones, that's for sure. All right. Well, we'll see if I can get this computer to work when we, uh, when I get up and going in a second. But nonetheless, uh, I was talking about, um, you know, what you need to really do is with a consultant. So someone like me, you know, you want to bring in from the get-go when you're starting. Um, and make sure that you have uh, everything, you know, that you need from them. So, you know, as an example, people oftentimes will call me when they've had their first, you know, oh man, what's happening? And they want me to kind of backtrack or do a, you know, a SWOT or a, uh, some sort of, you know, thing to figure out like, what, why did this happen? Whereas if we could have just been there at the beginning, you know, we could have really helped out. So, um, you know, that's one of the ways we make money. Um, the other way is, is that we are growers, you know, obviously we grow, um, you know, in our hub and spoke, we have foodery farms and, um, we have, uh, right now I'm working on marine land aquaponics, trying to get it up and going, which is, you know, a, it's going to be a pretty big facility. That's going to be about an acre and a half here in, uh, North Florida. And we're surrounded by 100,000 acres of um, commercial growth. So if you eat cabbages, Brussels sprouts, or potatoes this time of year, you probably are getting eating from our fields around our, our facility. Um, so, you know, even most people don't realize it, but, you know, I feel like we have, uh, if one aquaponics farm fails in food safety, we all are taking a hit. And so I always say to people, look, if you want to, you know, really represent, then spend the money in the science and food safety aspects. That could be, uh, I'm glad you brought that up too. Um, people always need to plan out when they're trying, choosing the location for the greenhouse. You know, a location directly next to a bunch of other agriculture is not always a good place, especially for cannabis where you have to worry about overspray or wind drift. Um, I know I had a, a contest entry disqualified from a, a contest I entered into for two parts per billion of a miticide and the closest we could tell was 1.6 miles away is where it was spread. So these are things you yeah. have to really be careful about and um, a little less so with vegetables but uh, particularly if you're getting into cannabis or, or other very um, heavily monitored uh, products it can be an issue. Well, the interesting thing is, is that, you know, what most people don't realize is that you have fish and if they're spraying their normal chemicals to, you know, um, deal with their, with their fields, you know, to, um, you know, they have Toulon and a variety of other things that they put, it could kill your fish. So you need to be mindful of the fact that when you're growing in a high ag area of, you know, those kinds of things, and that's part of your food safety plan. Okay, so you talk to your neighbors. Okay, look, are you going to be spraying anytime? Please let me know when you're spraying. Or in our case, they're, you know, crop dusting. And so, you know, we have to know because we have to pull up our screen, you know, all of our curtains. Uh, so we, you know, are differently controlled that day. Um, and, you know, we have the opportunity when we build our facilities down here below the 40th parallel, we're able to do a little bit of a different kind of control 
So we, we use some of mother nature when I'm, you know, up North and, you know, like we built a small place up in Hansville, Washington, you know, we don't have to worry about that because it's completely, you know, twin wall, you know, all of that. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, again, even just knowing that you have to deal with it to, to have the proper HVAC or what other um, means you need to do. I think most of us at this point have heard about, um, I forget, was it Aurora or Canopy, one or the other, but they ended up, uh, they had a big facility. Yeah. Over at the um, airport and they got say it again. So there was a, a big facility in Canada that was built next to an airport in Toronto and they were in jet fuel and jet fuel exhaust in the trichomes of their cannabis. And, you know, again, this is where a little bit of proper planning on the ventilation and stuff like that can be a, a quite a, quite the thing. Um, so what are or some of the other locations, right? I mean, what? somebody, yeah. somebody picked that property and probably shouldn't have, you know, like unless they already owned it. You know, you <laughs> and and it's a it's not something yeah, it you can necessarily understand if you've never like experienced something like that before or thought about it on that level. And so that kind of ties back to what she was saying before is that you know we've moved on from some of the basic science of like bell siphons and how system works and you know like all of that. You know, so we're the next level of concerns is is uh, you know. Once you have a system in place, keeping it clean and keeping your medicine clean and all of that stuff. And uh, and if you bring a consultant yeah, see, in from the start, like she was saying, like if I was there at the beginning of your project, I could have just said, hey, let's pick this other property instead. And and boom, no, no entire crop loss, no lawsuits, no uh, <clears throat> recalling product, no, none of that. And that, that's a perfect example of how just bringing in a consultant from the beginning instead of after you fuck up. Because after you fuck up, the consultant is just going to say, oh, hey, yeah, you have jet fuel <laughs> all over this stuff. Like, what, it, what are they going to do at that point other than just, like, recount how you fucked up? So, really, you're just paying someone to tell you how you fucked up and, and then help you do it better the next time when, really, you could just have them help you do it better the first time. So perfect example yeah i mean that's perfect that's a that's a great explanation of why i mean i you couldn't have put it any any better because like that's truly that's exactly why when i get there after you've already had your expectation you know your is, issue okay what do you want me to do a swot analysis you know that someone in your facility probably didn't do the proper uh your proper protocols or hell do you even have protocols that's the thing that's most scary is that many times people don't. Oh yeah. Or if you do, they were written by someone that had no clue what they were doing. Um, I was just out um, a couple months. Uh, I guess it was more than a couple months ago hey, guys, now, but the end of still? last year. Yep. Can you hear you? Yep, can, you hear? can you hear us? Hopefully, uh, I can still hear Steve. Yeah, I guess she's having problems again. We'll get it sorted. Um, but, but, hey, Steve. So we go. yeah, we go. he covered that perfectly about you know what when I get there after you've had your issue, you know then then what, you know um, the thing is is that you want me to be there before you you go commercial or you you really invest a lot of money. You know, that's the most important thing is, is that, you know, in the cannabis space, you know, I work with these guys who, you know, we're working in super sacks and we get to, um, you know, where they have the labs coming in or whatever that want to buy. And then all of a sudden, you know, oh, the labs want this, the labs want that. See, what's going to happen is, is that um, with, you know, cannabis is that if you aren't food safety certified, you're going to lose. Um, and that's really where I see it. I mean, I work with a lab down here in Florida that makes that has ndc numbers on their products they want to know from the seed to them where that stuff came from and you know that's part of the um the services that we provide is is that we not only help you with your food safety but part of food safety is traceability and so if we're not working in on your traceability if we can't know 
who was touching what, where, when, um, and you're, you know, when you're doing your sampling, you're screwed. And, you know, the thing is, is that you have millions of dollars invested possibly in your facility. And now what? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And, and I think that's, you know, that's just a great example because once you have a problem, even if you want to fix it and you, you, once you've identified that there's an issue, you're going to have to know where, where your stuff is being exposed. Like you're going to have to have something to fall back on. So if you don't have any protocols, if you don't have any tracking, you, you know, how are you going to know? You're going to have to go back and, and, and start from scratch, tracking all that stuff, where it goes, who does it and when to find out if it's just an employee that's, uh, that's not following, uh, you know, maybe it's something that you trained them to do, but not something you have a documented policy, which is probably like a large portion of cannabis grows, like especially people that came from the black market, you know, into the legal market, like, you know, there, there weren't very many black market operations that had standard operating procedures <laughs> written out, probably no, and that's the legal You're liability about- issues, if nothing else, <laughs> but, uh, but it was a it was definitely more of a mentality. So that's definitely a struggle coming in. But you really have to have it in a in a in the commercial environment nowadays. <clears throat> but it, I feel like that was a tough transition for people who were probably really great growers, but not great businessmen. I think that's but, uh, actually the thing that's most um, that I see most often. So, you know, I work with some guys over there in the Illinois Valley and and over there in that way. And they're still in, you know, black market mentality. And I have to say to you that don't be mad, friend, if you're not willing to adopt. You wanted it legal. You wanted to not go to jail. Now what? Okay. We need to make sure you're, 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 you are now have the opportunity to make millions of dollars on a herb, you know, that is medicine that can, you know, and for a fact can do things for people that is amazing, world changing. We need to embrace food safety from the get-go. You need to see that cannabis, I'm I'm saying food safety, but I you you guys follow what I'm saying is cannabis is food. So if you're gonna the I think the one thing that you know when I've been involved in the the information and the conversations uh you know both in my state and nationally about food safety is people don't wanna follow the same rules as food, but I think that they're missing the mark if they don't. And I think that's the most important thing that people really need to pay attention to is the fact that paying attention to the food safety rules is going to like embrace them from the get go. And you're going to be better off because you'll then be able to get a draw a higher, um, you know, when all the markets going up and down, you know, like the hemp market, the cannabis market, you know, when you're in your all the way to the super sack. Okay, so in hemp, we talk about super sacks. You guys are talking about totes and stuff like that over in cannabis. Um, You know, I see people who are nitrogen storing uh, their products. And, you know, they they know that we have a a lot of products for opportunity in the market. So, you know, it's like corn growers. When the corn uh, is, you know, low, everybody holds on to their products. Same thing with cannabis growers. And so, you know, what, what what I say to them is, okay, how are you able to maintain your levels that you're trying, that you're telling people? Uh, that's food safety. That's your traceability. That's the kinds of stuff that we offer to say, hey, how are you maintaining that? How are we, how can we prove that to our clients? That's what sets, you know, the people who are business people going forward versus the, you know, the, the black market growers who are like, you know what, man? I'm the best grower out here and, you know, you can't tell me anything and, you know, I've already made my blah. No, I want to say to you, my brother, you need to get on board so that you could continue to make whatever you're making and you're growing your high quality, you know, medicine. So what are some of the more common um, food safety mistakes that you see, you know, on a regular basis? (laughs) First thing is pets. Everybody wants their dang pet in their facilities. No, that's that's the most common thing that I see. Uh, Rover likes to come to the farm with me, or kitty kitty is keeps away the rats. No, that is not okay. 
you have to have a plan for when you have animals visit or when you have animals in your facility. The other facility, other things that I see are things such as just basic hygiene protocol. For instance, proper gloving and hand washing. Um, you know, people coming to work, your farmer workers coming to work dirty. Um, those, if, you, if you're in this industry, you need to make sure that your people have clean clothes. If, you, if they can't, you need to provide them clean clothes, especially if you want to set yourself apart, okay? And, you know, like I've said, aquaponics practitioners, we figured out the system. The biology is getting close. Now, the major hurdle in every area, cannabis, all the new market, you must address the, the safety. So the safety for your employees and so forth. So, for instance, like I'll come to a facility and I'll ask them, well, what are your protocols for entry? Do you have everyone that comes to your place should sign in? Where's your visitor log? When your visitors sign in, do you give them, okay, look with your eyes, not your hands conversations? Because I, I'm going to tell you my, my very own self, when I go to a cannabis operation and they have those big old sappy, beautiful buds, I'm, 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 in, I'm intrigued. Like I, I like, I am intrigued. I want to look at it. I want to touch it but it's not okay. I don't ever do it. I keep my hands in my pockets, but people, there should be a, a protocol for how people enter your facility, how they walk through your facility. Even, you know, these are visitors. When you have your employees, how do you manage your employees? How do you keep them from having so many steps? You know, a tired employee will make you have some, some safety issues. So how are you working to keep your employees from not having, you know, your food safety? Steve, how are you guys doing? Are you guys doing Dutch bucket? How are you doing your, uh, your grows? So we, we do all of ours with grow beds, with flood and drain, with uh, dual root zone pots. Okay. All right. So you do at, at flood drain and you have this, do you have the stainless steel uh, flood drain tables that uh, take up, you know, that half of the facility? And you have a concrete walkway in the middle? Uh, no, it depends on the facility design. A lot of times we'll also use um, uh, either wood or we'll use um, uh, metal framed uh, beds and then we'll put the liner in uh, and okay. do them that way with uh, either concrete or uh, some for the ground and the, the local terrain too. Yeah, so here's one of the things that I see. Um, in to get an SQF certification, uh, wood is one of those concerns that is always a problem. I have a really hard time in a facility getting a, a, a food safety certification with wood, and here's why. You have to have a hygiene protocol for how you clean that wood, and wood is porous and it can flake off. So I always say to people, hey, if you're gonna use wood in your facility, make sure it's covered with plastic so that you are you do not have harboring of you know bugs or whatever i really like steel you know the galvanized i really like the uh concrete i really like the stainless steel uh ebb flow tables um i could send you some pictures of some stuff so what i the reason i asked if you had those tables has to do with uh hygiene protocols so traditionally what happens is is they you uh flow the tables they come to a certain level, and then you have drains on the other end that have um, uh, gutter collection. All right. Where I see a lot of food safety issues, whether it be cannabis or food, is the fact that people don't address their gutters. There are, and that to me is, I always, my mantra is DK will bring in bugs. And if you have a pest intrusion, you have a whole series of other food safety, you know, issues. So, you know, when you're doing your approved vendor list or your approved protocols for uh, chemicals and stuff like that, how are you managing for those things? You know, most people think that Quat um, or Clorox really can't be in our aquaponics facilities. That's actually not true. And so, you know, you have to know that you're not over pushing 
in your quat or your uh, your chlorine in your your solutions. Um, so you know you need to have a protocol in place for that. So like basic hygiene is one of the things where I see the majority of uh, issues. The other place I see it is in the storage. How do people store it? Yeah, I, a lot of people use those tough totes, the various size tough totes uh, and vacuum seal it or, or store it just directly in those with um, dehumidifier, uh, like the, um, the Gavita packs or whatever they're called. Yep. So let me tell you an interesting uh, thing that we had happen in one of the facilities I was working with. So we had a large customer come in. Uh, they wanted 100,000 uh, pounds of product, uh, delivered uh, 10,000 pounds a week for 10 weeks. Um, and the first, we, you know, we send this, uh, we open up the tote, you know, you put your, um, your test tube, we, we, we put our, it's like a vacuum for us to be able to send it to, to a third party lab to verify what we're saying as the, you know, points and uh, levels and terpenes and blah, blah, blah. So we get to the first one and, you know, I'm like, okay, are you using first in first out? So I said to the, my client, Hey, are you using FIFO? And they're like, FIFO. And I'm like, first in, first out. I'm like, so we need to go to the containers where you have just placed, um, you know, the, the oldest one you have, and let's get data from that one. And they, we could not tell which was first in, which was for, we, 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 we couldn't tell that. So those are the kinds of examples that I see happen everywhere. So you know, I would say to you, if you're spending the money to and the infrastructure to go, you know, big cannabis, you need to be spending the infrastructure to buy yourself some sort of barcoding. Uh, you know, I like, I started with uh, Allison, um, what was Agrilist was now Artemis, with being able to do tracking and traceability. And she worked with me on barcoding and, and being able to barcode through the facility. And I always say to people, look, this is not a paid advertisement for Allison, but I like their system. It works. It's easy. Anybody can use it. You don't have to speak the same language. You just click, click, click every you know position. And um, you know, so there's all sorts of programs out there, and a lot of ag tech is using this, you know, uh, AI and stuff like that, which I think is going to come to play because AI can actually, you know, with the blockchain and all a variety of things like that. It actually allows us to be able to do a lot of this, but I think that first baby steps, you need to get those those traceabilities, those standard operating procedures, those HACCP plans all in place. So what are your thoughts on uh, probiotics as part of your food safety plans? Um, uh, have you experimented I, with any of that? Uh, we, like I said, we I've successfully for, for yeah. a wide range of things. Yeah, I think actually um, you and I talked about this offline. Uh, probiotics is is not a lot of people have under, understand them and have put them into place in ag. I actually have had a whole conversation about how to use probiotics in a hydro facility, and people looked at me like I was, you know, a three eyed monkey, because I actually think that it's it's one of the ways that um, it's one of those sciences that that's one of those areas where I'm saying to you, that's, that's our future. Um, you know, we have, uh, I'm in, I'm in research on some of this right now, so I'm not going to talk a whole lot about it, but, um, we actually have dosed, um, with different concentrations of probiotics to see what, you know, what, what kind of benefits we can get in our outside facilities and our inside facilities. Um, we are doing some, uh, you know, like you can make your own, most people don't pay attention to this, but like you can make your own probiotics and, you know, um, with our fish, I mean, people sell this. If you go to the store, you're buying, if you buy any of the Korean, um, stuff where, um, they're using like uh, compost teas and stuff like that. Some of the Bokashis and, 
a lot of that is under the premise of if you talk to those scientists, they're going to talk to you about probiotics. And I think that if an aquaponics uh, practitioner is not thinking about it, you know, they're missing the mark. We had a question from chat and says uh, heavy metals like mercury are critical uh, in people buying fish now. Is organic certified grown aquaponic fish meat possible? Um, yes. Imagine making this a new market for clean meats. Yeah, so um, really in our facilities, we shouldn't, if you're, unless you're doing pond culture, I mean, you really shouldn't be uh, really looking at this as an issue. Um, you know, like we grow hybrid striped bass and I think organic fish, I mean, you can get those certifications today. And you know, this is the other thing is, is a lot of aquaponic practitioners don't think of fish as a major market for money. That's one of the things we're working on right now, Steve, is, is to, in that, that's kind of the slow walking of marine land is, it was previously a, one of the largest um, aquaculture facilities in the Southeast from 1980. Um, I mean, he pushed out uh, 237 uh, tons of fish a year, something like that. We're looking at doing 53 tons. So I've been working on making sure the science is right. And we are looking at an organic fish certification for that. And you can actually get that today. That's really cool. Yeah, it's something that uh, I guess I was previously always told that there wasn't an, an organic fish certification. So I'm glad that there is now. Yeah, you can actually, there's some really interesting things happening in, happening in the aquaculture space. Um, and uh, you know, looking at uh, right now, like last month, uh, aqu aquaculture worldwide are sent out RAS Tech, and then the RAS Tech magazine they were talking about a whole variety of uh, kind of new science things. You know, I think the other thing, Steve, where we're going to see some uh, good science is um, uh, positioning, and this is one of the things. This is our research is around uh, making our soil water better um, and seeing what. Uh, areas we can go into. So we believe that we can grow vegetables in um, estuary or, or brackish waters. So we believe that there's an opportunity for people in aquaponics to uh, make a market in the, uh, you know, the estuary fish market. Um, so if we had to go to a climate situation, a crisis, you know, the majority of, they call the estuaries, the baby nurseries of the ocean. So, you know, there is an idea that we could possibly grow vegetables in these facilities. So we, you know, we've been looking at stuff like that as well. Yeah, just uh, just be careful again with nightshades and with uh, um, lettuces as well, because they both can transfer viroids. Uh, if you're not getting from the best uh, seed stock it can be a problem. Oh, I, I agree with you. So one of the things that, um, you know, we've been looking at is um, virus-free uh, applications. So there are actually commercial applications uh, for land-based uh, productions that are you're gonna start seeing more of. Um, and those land-based production folks have to figure out how they're going to partner to deal with their sludge. And so I think it's only logical that we would actually figure that out. Don't you think, Steve? We're, we're smart enough. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, we actually just last week had um, a product called Fish Shit on, uh, and they uh, take uh, aquaculture waste and um, uh, ferment it and shelf stabilize it and then sell it as a, a shelf stable product. So they were our actually, guest. If, uh, if you get your, your, your black gold, I have not found it to denature if you handle it correctly. Um, so I, I stored mine six, eight, 12 months. Um, the only thing is, is you can't close it in. <laughs> Uh, the the postmaster in St. Louis told me all about it one time because I closed it in a little too much and I sent some stuff through a mail to uh, work on better microbes for my uh, facility and uh, it blew up in um, the St. Louis um, major like uh, mail facility there and he wrote a note and told me don't you ever they had like hazmat out there and everything. And, Free uh, microbes for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> you get microbes. You get microbes. Yeah. Some for you, some for you, some for you. Yeah. And so uh, 
Yeah, so uh, St. Louis apparently is a large place where a lot of uh, mail goes through. And oops, um, they dealt with aquaponics water one time. That's great. <laughs> Do you have any guys, anybody else uh, questions on the internet? Hey, are no. these uh, things that we can like show to uh, people in the future? Oh yeah, this will be, the video will be recorded and up and then the audio will also be recorded and up in both formats. Um, let me see here. So uh, is, there, is there any issues with heavy metals that you found with aquaponics uh, as far as the plants? We have not. Um, I actually had um, someone uh, challenge me on BPAs and some uh, variety of other things. So I, I had a full um, spectrum uh, analysis done on um, water on my coldest day, uh, water on my hottest day, and then the associated plants. And um, we were actually not been uh, the whole, <laughs> it kind of ticked me off. But um, the whole um, uh, report was like not uh, not found zero or like to the thousandth uh, for certain things. Um, so um, I haven't been able to find all of the concerns that people, you know, get get upset about that they they accuse us of. I haven't been able to scientifically prove uh, their 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 concerns. I can disprove it, but I can't find anything to validate their concerns. Um, heavy metals is uh, a thing that I think a lot of us should consider, um, especially depending upon your water um, and where you are in the world. Um, and you know, that's one of the things. You know, you, your plants. If you look at your plants and pay attention to your plants, they'll tell you a lot. I've seen high heavy metal levels in people that really went completely overboard with uh, kelp and seaweed extracts. Oh yeah, um, that I've seen. Well, my you know my premise is is that leave your system alone. Don't chase chemicals. Don't put chemicals in because you'll chase your ass the whole time. Yeah, uh, we definitely talk about um, balancing it out and getting in the right levels and only adding what you need and all that stuff. And um, we definitely see regularly uh, molybdenum, boron, and some other micronutrient uh, 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 deficiencies on quite a regular basis. Um, but you have a you have a solution for that, Steve. I mean, oh yeah, you, you and I both know that there's we can we can micro titrate and get what we need. You know, I mean, so many times people over push and you think more is better. Uh, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've been to a, a facility and seen, you know, things where, uh, oh, well, somebody told me to put some Epsom salt. And so, you know, I bought a whole bag of sun, grow, of sun, sun um, pellets and poured it in. And, you know, the other thing is, is like, you know, let's talk about fish. So, you know, when people uh, get diseased fish or whatever, um, I notice a lot of times it's because of system design issues. Um, and, you know, you should be transitioning your tanks. Everybody has their kind of idea. We like to transition our tank uh, two to three times an hour. Um, and, the, you know, those are the kinds of things that we like to, we like to flush, um, you know, and move our stuff through. Uh, we don't flush in some of the ways that uh, there are some people out there selling some, uh, we should call it hardware. Um, I don't. I don't think that that's the kind of flush because you actually take off when you do some of your uh, uh, bubbling and a lot of that stuff. You actually have uh, you're you're disrobing or taking the uh, stripping off the bacteria that you are actually trying desiring for your system. And so you don't. You know you're trying to hijack the nitrogen system or the nitrogen cycle basically and get your micros and macros through there. And people just really, that concept isn't, you know, you don't like to be shoved around and thrown apart. And, you know, if you're holding on to somebody, you don't want somebody pushing you away. Well, the microbes feel the same way.
Uh, let's see if there's any other questions in chat here. Um, is there um, anything else you wanted to mention? Oh, so you do only uh, uh, beneficial insects for, for pest management and, and probiotics and things. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and maybe some of the stuff that uh, you've, um, you know, are you dealing with uh, particularly the aphids uh, and maybe anything else that you're seeing commonly uh, as far as yeah, insect so, um one of the things, another great cannabis guy at Crop Walk, Crop Talk is Charlie McKenzie. And uh, you guys know Charlie? Charlie digs what we do. And he actually has um, really some great uh, biologicals um, in the pest realm that anything that you could encounter in a greenhouse, Charlie's got a bug for it. And, you know, um, I always rely on, you know, experts in that arena. I, um, I, I key it out. So I, ca I classify what bug it is. Um, and, uh, and then I, I, I reach out to the people who uh, know that best. Now, here's the beautiful thing about that hygiene thing I was telling you about, Steve, is that if you manage your, your system and your process well enough, your pest suppression is suppressed. I mean, when you come to our outdoor, our foodery in Jacksonville, if you come to foodery, you're going to start walking in biosecurity as soon as you walk through the gate. Um, and so by the time you've gotten to my greenhouse where it's, you're going to walk in, we've done a whole bunch of stuff to uh, eliminate pests off of you. And then we don't have a lot of um, issues with pests because of the intense biosecurity protocols that we use. But if we do get a pest, we use, you know, um, I mean, parasitic, I mean, there's all sorts of, where are, what we normally get are caterpillars, as crazy as it sounds, because somebody will leave a light on and they're drawn to the light. And then all of a sudden it's like, so in our outdoor uh, decoupled systems, we, you know, we monitor for aphids and a variety of other things. So, you know, there's all sorts of things like surfactants that, you know, people use on the ground. Like we, you know, we talk about, um, we wash, uh, you know, our feet in this, um, you know, when, when we walk through apple cider vinegar, we've, we've used all sorts of things in wives tales and a variety of other things. None of them has worked as well as, uh, you know, like Charlie McKenzie stuff, um, the uh, Abrico, the um, lady, I mean, ladybugs. I mean, there's all sorts of things that you can use for pest suppression. Um, but if you have intense biosecurity, your suppression is much less. Uh, is there, so have you um, run into anything, any curveballs or any uh, interesting stuff, particularly viruses or, or um, I don't know, anything oh, yeah. else that's particularly challenging? The mosaics, um, you know, we've, we've run into uh, some stuff, you know, and some like, I, I know this is, I keep harping on this, but some of it is about the controls. Every, I say to people, every plant likes a little blow. Every plant likes a little, they want to have a little movement in their air. They want to have, uh, you know, uh, movement. So let me tell you what happens in our greenhouse if we have, we find something with a virus. That plant immediately comes out, um, is taken to uh, what we call quarantine, and we key out, what is it? What do we have here? Is this something that's going to be in our water or is this just simply going to be, you know, top based? Um, in other words, above the ground or uh, above the raft. Um, and how do we deal with that? Um, and, you know, we, we work science. So, you know, when people, I know you, you and I both know what keying it out means, but maybe other people don't. That means you, you figure out the, what, what the bug is. Um, and, you know, you can do this now with your, with your cell phone. You could take a picture of the bug. And there are so many projects or softwares out there that you can actually use to say, hey, this is what that is. And then, you know, like you have Abrico Organics, you have a variety of places where you can get, if you're just a small hobby grower and you're trying to overcome, you know, some things, 
first of all, look at your hygiene. Second of all, use, use the uh, soft, free software out there to find out what it is that you're dealing with. The other thing is, is your seeds. You need to get seeds from a certified uh, stock. Um, a lot of times people love these seed exchanges and you may be getting something that's not good or that, you know, um, the, the uh, genetic series of it, the F, you know, the F of the series could be, could be uh, tainted or could not be for your environment or, you know, that sort of thing. So the other thing that I see a lot of aquaponics people do is they bring stuff in from the ground and they think that they're not going to, they're going to wash the roots off and um, they're going to be all right. You're bringing in a whole series of different issues next to your, if you're doing like uh, quarantined, you know, highly controlled environment. I see um, people bring in, you know, oh, you know, I just want to save this. I want to get a mother plant off of this, or this is my mother or whatever. And I, I'm like, okay, you're new, but okay. So you want to, you want that plant to keep growing, right? And they're like, right. And then all of a sudden they have an outbreak of something else. So I always say to people, look, there's a reason why you have an area there where there's nothing else going on. Quarantine your stuff. Yeah, Other curve so balls have been uh, when I did not practice the hygiene that we uh, practice today. Uh, we found that's how we came to know that people brought in most of our bugs. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, too, not having um, proper microbial diversity too uh, will help if you do have a genetics that has a, a viroid infection, it might not express itself if you have, uh, you know, proper microbial uh, uh, life. We've seen that. Uh, I know Chris Trump's talked about treating mosaic viruses with IMO treatments, um, indigenous microorganisms, and, and had quite a bit of success with treating it in tomatoes, but uh, uh, is yet to be seen if that works in cannabis, but it's definitely a direction for people to try if they do run Well, into the those. interesting thing is, is that we should be looking at our, you know, you should be looking at what's going on in, in your, what I'll say, nutrient water. You should be looking at that. You, I mean, really you're, like I said, I, I have said a few times in this you know, podcast, we really should be paying attention to the, to the biology of our nutrient water. I know that's one of the things that, you know, I admire about you, Steve, is, is that you're paying attention to that. You know, I, I suspect that if you're a, a commercial operator, you should be looking at what is going on in my water. I want to make sure that I don't get any of those, anything that could cause me to have a shutdown in my facility. Um, you know, it's kind of the whole lean practice of growing is one of the lean practices to me is, is that you should be paying attention to your nutrient water. You should be also paying attention to your hygiene process within your, you know, moving bed bioreactors or however you're transitioning. If you're doing, you know, a moving bed bioreactor, if you're doing, you know, a variety of other, whatever way you are transitioning your solid fish waste to your liquid uh, plant food, you should be paying attention to making sure you don't have anaerobic corners and that you don't have other issues in that area. And, and I think that's also a place where things like lactobacillus bacteria and things like that, that actually will feed on a lot of those problem areas. And um, we also talk about putting in black worms, uh, again, another microbe that loves to feed on bacteria in those types of zones, breaks them up, brings in fresh water and gets them oxygenated again. Um, you know, having these, these plans and, and setups uh, ahead of time for that and part of your regular dosing regimen. Um, I know we've definitely moved towards adapting a lot of the the Korean natural farming inputs into our, both our mineralization as well as just regular maintenance dosing into the systems to, uh, to accel accelerate a lot of these, these things and eliminate a lot of these types of problems um, after quite a bit of uh, you know, large scale testing. Yeah, I mean, that's the one thing about, I can say to you that uh, looking at the Korean work of um, 
you know, <laughs> if you people need to pay attention to that. Um, and I think it's especially important um, in our field. Whereas if, when you're trying to transition your, uh, your, you know, fish solid, so to speak, because, you know, one of the other things that I notice is, is that people push too far, their particles are too big in their, in their uh, grow beds. Um, and that's, that's a concern to me. Um, and it's also a food safety concern. And so how do you deal with that? What does it look like? How do you overcome those things? Those are all concerns that many people don't pay attention to. Um, and in a food safe facility, you will. You know, if you're trying to do a, a drip irrigation facility um, in aquaponics, which is totally possible. Um, so you're doing, you know, like a perlite with Grodan or a lay flat and you're drip irrigating and then, you know, pushing out. You know, really one of the things that you should be concerning yourself with is clog uh, because you'll, that causes, you know, your, the, um, the tubes will get clogged if your particles are too big. You know that your stuff has not bioreacted enough in my mind that if you're always getting clogs. Yeah, I, I know that we don't, we don't, on, at least on our systems, we don't do anything smaller than half an inch on our, our feed lines just to prevent those kinds of problems because between biofilm and just all the other things that go on in aquaponics can definitely be a challenge. So, Biofilms are my favorite things. To talk about because everyone wants to, wants to uh, you know talk about their system design and biofilms are the biggest challenge um, for food safety in most systems in aquaponics and that's be that has strictly to do many times with hygiene. Uh, was there um, what do you kind of see? How do you see the fo food safety stuff in the future? Uh, ending up for aquaponics. So what do you think are some of the things that need well, to happen sooner than later I, uh, in order to make sure that we have a, a future as an industry? I think that more people need, I think we'll see more people becoming more commercial and adopting. Um, that's my goal and my hope, um, especially in our, our hub and spoke approach. We're trying to find farmers who want to join us um, and you know really do this thing to the masses. Um, I think the, um, the future is uh, blockchain. We're gonna see a lot of feedback to us um, based upon, uh, so probes and stuff like that in your systems. I'm not talking about robots because in aquaponics, you're, you're gonna need people. And I think that's the beautiful thing about aquaponics is that you know, we, we need people in our system and people need jobs, especially if we're going to do, um, you know, for the future, you know, we're gonna have to uh, increase the amount of food we grow but the important thing is, is that um, we need people to do that and we, people need jobs. And so I think that's, you know, first of all, we're going to need to train our people to be, you know, food safety conscious, you know, to be aware of the food safety issues. I think that uh, probes will allow us to know what's happening in our, our um, for optimization of grow. And those probes will be a series of challenges as well to learn how to uh, properly digest the science. And if those probes give us the feedback we need, that will need to be part of the food safety plan. And I think in aquaponics, we're not only gonna have, you know, the probes that we would have for our plants, but we're also gonna have the probes for, you know, our fish operations and then our, how we transition. I think we're on the opportunity. We, we, are, we need to see ourselves as pioneers and the opportunity to make our own fertilizer. And because of that, the conversation that we have with our inspectors isn't that we have fish and the fish water is, you know, what's, it's not a fertilizer. It's a, you know, that's, it's not a raw manure that's right there next to our plants. It's a fertilizer. And that we have a fertilizer maker in our facility, not a raw manure facility. Um, so these are the kinds of, uh, your your conversations need to be appropriate with your uh, the food safety inspectors, and the other thing is is don't be afraid to um, to open your uh, your coat and say, hey look I need help, and this is what I'm trying to do, and truth of the matter is is that people will help you, um, and if you go to our nonprofit website which is the Center for Sustainable Agricultural Excellence and Conservation, uh, so CS 
aec.org. We actually have put in a lot of uh, resources for people. Um, and that's a nonprofit. It's strictly uh, funded with uh, donations. Um, and we do aquaponics in schools because we believe that uh, our future hinges on children understanding the importance of how we farm. Um, and so I really see the future as a biology um, for us. It's gonna be all in the biology and food safety. And I think if we embrace them, both of those things, we will actually, as an industry, uh, propel forward and outpace many other industries in this space. Absolutely, too. And, and both of us have talked about, you know, the need to move towards whitelisting inputs, whitelisting pest management protocols and whitelisting some of this other stuff to get ahead of the regulators so that we don't end up in a bad situation where they're trying to regulate it for us or, you know, otherwise uh, causing us headache. Well, I think the crazy thing is, is that people think that they have some special cog. There are no special cogs. The special cogs now are in biology and food safety. And your system has been figured out. That's, that's figured out. Move on, folks. It's kind of where I'm at with it. Let's, let's get to the science of it. Let's get to the real meat of it. Oh, absolutely. And that's it's in, often interesting to see when people, you end up testing people's water and then <laughs> just how radically off some of their nutrients are and, uh, and how, um, you know, quickly just a little bit of adjustment can get everything right back on track. So again, it's, it's something that um, uh, I've been working on a book to get that out. Um, first cannabis and then vegetables, and then we'll have a lot of those stuff out there in the world for people. Um, I've been working with a lot of different farms and been averaging out a lot of different crops along with university data and a bunch of other stuff. So uh, it'll be cool to put that stuff out here in the future. And uh, I know you, you do a lot of work in that realm as well with SOPs and, and getting everyone uh, on track as well, which is, is really wonderful. Yeah, that's, that's really the goal is, is, you know, to really be able to, um, this isn't, this doesn't have to be hard. We can have, you know, just as my ground farmers, um, you know, we're working on our first generation of major, you know, aquaponics farmers. And, um, you know, I'm hoping to have, you know, by the time we, you and I close our eyes for the last time that, you know, we have three or four or five generations behind us that are rocking it and based upon the show, the standing on our shoulders of the things that we learned so that it's not so hard. People can grow their food. You know, we put food where food is needed and medicine as in cannabis medicine. Um, we're able to grow and grow well and um, have, you know, ships stable, uh, high quality products. Awesome. Uh, how, how do people find you if they want to find out more about uh, your services or um, follow more about what you do or take some of your webinars or things? Yeah, so we have, um, you can um, connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, you can go to Foodery Farms on Facebook. Um, you can always reach me there. Uh, you can um, go through our nonprofit webpage, which is csaec.org, or you can farm, uh, go to our design build consultation uh, website, which is aqua, A Q U A H O R T U S dot farm, aquahortus dot farm. Um, and that's one way of being able to uh, direct connect uh, to us, um, you know, but I'm, I'm pretty easy to reach. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I try to help if I can. And, um, but remember, cheap ain't good and good ain't cheap. That's my favorite thing to say. <laughs> I'm not saying that I'm crazy expensive, but, uh, you know, I, I have, I'm booked out right now through almost May. Um, I'm going, I'll be in Europe, uh, the ninth through the 18th. Um, we're doing some stuff in Czech Republic. Um, and, um, you know, we're, we'll be in the Caribbean. Uh, we're helping some brothers and sisters kind of all over the world, try to start their aquaponics dream. And, uh, we can, we believe that, um, you know, we can do this in a large way and feed a lot of people. And, um, so our, you know, our favorite thing to say is, the farm hers are the land army, and uh, we are putting food where food is needed 24-7, 365 with our 
innovative uh, farming technique and uh, vending machines that we have attached to the front of our farms. Awesome. Um, is there any last advice you want to give people for food safety plans or, or anything else before we let you go? I don't want to take up your whole day. Uh, yeah, I think the most important thing is, is look at your practice, do what you say and say what you do and prove it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to come on. Uh, love to have you on again sometime uh, and, and talk more about um, you know, your, your further future experiences with working and especially abroad, it'd be cool to have you back on again in the future. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time and, and sharing with us uh, what you do and then uh, giving people uh, another resource for them to reach out to if they're having issues with their own farm. All right, thanks, Steve. Keep it going, my friend. <laughs> yep, thank you. Take care. Keep away from the mambas. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks. Cheers. Well, that was really awesome. It was really wonderful to have her on. I've uh, been trying to, to get a hold of her and, and get her on the show for quite a while. She's a great resource if you're trying to get GAP certified or any of the other certifications that she mentioned. And um, there's quite a few there, uh, some that I had never heard of before. So that was quite exciting. Um, uh, but uh, quite the exciting day. I had scorpions and uh, and snakes and all kinds of things at the farm. We were doing some, some light work today, just kind of doing some surveying and stuff. So that was fun. Um, and uh, yeah, if you guys are looking for um, and need help with your nutrients on your farm and you're running a commercial aquaponics farm, you can check out trueaquaponics.com. Uh, there I, I work with Roger on a, we have a subscription service uh, where we can set up your nutrients tested in send you the nutrients all in one easy to use, uh, easy dose packaging uh, you tear open and um, fix your nutrients right back up depending on what crops you're growing. Um, so we can fill in any gaps that you're having with your mineralization or, or whatever else you're having issues with and get you back on track. Um, and then, yeah, just kind of getting ready to, to go here. As you can see, got a mosquito net rocking that, kind of getting settled in. Um, so uh, yeah, just kind of getting everything going. I'm gonna work on getting the office set up so I have that and have a more permanent uh, studio again. I get the backdrop up again and, and the rest. So we'll have that uh, hopefully in the next uh, week or two. And uh, just working on booking some more cool guests. Uh, we had a question in chat about um, what about a product called API that eliminates chlorine and chloramine with added aloe vera, is that something to avoid? Uh, API makes a couple of different um, products for dechlorinating. In general, in aquaponics, if you're just topping your system off, you the amount of chlorine you're adding is only gonna be beneficial to the plants um, yeah, and not enough to harm anything. So if you're just topping your system off, I wouldn't worry about it unless you have maybe really sensitive fry or tropical fish, then, then it might be worth it. But otherwise, I wouldn't even sweat it. Um, uh, it's just kind of not needed, but you can use a product called Prime uh, from CCAM in an emergency to temporarily lock up your nitrate, extreme nitrates or extreme nitrates. Uh, if you do have an emergency, um, I don't know, fish kill, fish spawn, uh, some of the other things like that that might suddenly slam your nitrogen levels, uh, you can use that in a pinch but um, it will temporarily lock up a lot of your nitrogen. So you'll have a temporary nitrogen deficiency in your plants, but it's, it's not gonna hurt anything long-term uh, or make the plant not smokable or anything like that. So it can be used as an emergency, but you know, kind of only if you're, something really goes wrong. Um, great documentary, you know, it's good. Let's see if there's any questions here. What is the key difference between aquaponics and normal hydroponics? Sorry, my bad English, I'm from Finland. Uh, well, so the difference between aquaponics and hydroponics is hydroponics typically uses just chemical inputs uh, and doesn't really rely on, and traditionally doesn't rely on probiotics and, and microbial inputs uh, to increase the bioavailability. It just uses high levels of nutrients. Whereas aquaponics uses fish waste with a little bit of mineral adjustment um, in order to provide the best source for, for plants. Uh, to, to feed from and the fish manure provides you know the vast majority of the nutrients 
is that you get the newts from the fish instead of the bottle yes yeah so you do again you will miss a few things uh, iron being the main one um, you're going to have to provide for uh, as the fe2 generally doesn't stay available long in water unless it's chelated um, and then um, you know you have to adjust your ph and um, you know occasionally add other nutrients uh, which we've talked about especially if you listen to the first um, 12 to 20 episodes of the show we talked about kind of a beginner's guide to aquaponic cannabis and a lot of the nutrient basics and things like that. Um, we'll go into more in depth on that here once we get set up here in Africa. Uh, I'll do some more uh, in in depth videos on different nutrients and things like that. But for the time being, uh, I'll just do some some other types of videos. We do a lot of probiotic stuff here uh, soon. A lot of IMO collection, a lot of other things like that that we'll be doing. Um, uh, in the short term, and then some pest management I, IMO collection where we breed microbes that feed on insect shells and things like that. So it'd be fun to teach you guys some new tricks. So we're working on that. We're also going to work on a video series. We're going to do a, a whole video series in Shona as well uh, with a lot of the grow methods so that the people here in Zimbabwe have a, you know, a, a resource and a playlist that's all in their, their native language here for, I guess, about 80% of the country speaks Shona. So uh, that'll be really cool. Um, yeah, so other than that, just been uh, busy, busy, busy getting ready, um, just getting everything together, getting resources we need for the house, um, getting a little bit extra groceries in case the virus ever ends up hitting up in Africa. I heard it's starting to really get crazy over there in the States. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and then um, check out uh, Marty. Uh, he's at AP Meds on uh, Instagram, AP Meds on YouTube, and AP Meds on Patreon. Uh, him and I are working on some a longer format um, recorded version of the online class. So uh, we'll have a, a full four, four, maybe even five day uh, class that we'll have. Uh, we redid a lot of the slides uh, and um, really did a, a longer, longer in-depth version. So we'll have that available hopefully in the in the next month or two, it depends on my internet connection and the power. The power does go in and out here sometimes, so um, that can be an issue. Uh, and um, yeah, so we're working on recording that, so we'll have that available for you guys and then trying to get the book out here soon. Um, we're just working on that. Uh, I got a really awesome illustrator that I'm working with named Nathan. Uh, shout out to him if he's listening. And uh, really excited to work with him on, on getting this book finished. And um, yeah, just spending a little bit of time each day. Uh, you know, after the sun goes down, there's not a whole lot to do in the middle of nowhere. So I've uh, just been kind of working on writing that in the evenings. Uh, so gives me something to do. <laughs> um, and shout out to Dude Grows. Got my Dude Grows shirt on. Dude Grows representing in Africa. <laughs> Uh, all right. If you don't listen to their show, check them out. They're a really good show. Uh, DoGrows.com and DoGrows on YouTube. And uh, yeah, we'll wrap the show up. If you uh, are listening to this on the audio version, you can check us out on YouTube. Uh, if you want to see the video and if you uh, are listening to this in the video, watching the video, you can find us on SoundCloud, iTunes, iHeartRadio, uh, all the various places and things um, it, where you can listen to a podcast, Google Podcasts, all the different things. And um, yeah, we'll see you guys again next week. Um, I'm not quite sure who we're going to have on, but uh, on Q we have uh, some really awesome people, uh, including the guy from uh, Crime Pays and Botany Doesn't. I'm really excited to have him on. And um, yeah, I don't know who we have on for our next episode, but he's definitely going to be on in the next month or so. So i uh, really stoked on that. So uh, definitely check us out on uh, all the other platforms. We have uh, almost over 400 hours of content. Uh, and thank you for everyone who helped me reach 7,000 subscribers over on YouTube this week. Um, you know, quite the milestone. Uh, I didn't think I'd ever hit 7,000. So thanks, everybody. And if you haven't subscribed, uh, please like and subscribe, uh, whatever platform you're listening to this on. And it really helps us out and helps us expand our listenership. And uh, you know, we don't make any money off of this podcast. We've had uh, quite a few offers for sponsors. We've just turned them down because we feel that, um, you know, uh, it's just not the right thing to do when you're trying to talk about a products and stuff. And uh, 
um, but we, we definitely try to give it a variety of different topics on. So thanks for everyone for your support and um, we'll see you guys again uh, in the next episode. Cheers.